Hi, geography students. This is Ms. Wildy. This is our video lecture over Chapter 3, Migration. Uh, as always, please have your study guide out so you can uh, jot down answers to questions on the study guide as well as any other questions you might have to ask in class. Of course, the first question should be, what is migration? Really, it's a type of movement, and there are three types of movement. There is cyclic movement, which is where you have very short periods away from home. You're home more often than you're away. So things like commuting to school or going to baseball practice. It could be things a little longer, like a vacation, or um, if you have uh, retired grandparents that live half the year in North Carolina and half the year in Florida. That's still cyclic movement. Uh, and also new, nomadism is a part of cyclic movement. So this is people that move every three or four months with the seasons. They typically stay in the same three or four places and they're just moving between those for the seasons to follow the food source. For periodic movement, that's a little bit longer. That's where you're longer away from your home than you are at home. So if you go away to college for nine months and then come home for the summer, you're away longer than you are at home. That's periodic movement. Uh, if you are in military service, oftentimes you're deployed for something like two or three years and then you're home for three or four months and then you're deployed somewhere else. Uh, typically, migrant labor is also periodic because you're gone for a couple years and then you um, send home remittances and then you go home perhaps after that. And then lastly, transhumanance is also periodic. This is where you have ranchers often that bring their cattle, it could be even 500 or 1,000 head of cattle, out away from the winter where it, there's no grass, it's too cold, there's no you know barn large enough to put them in. You move them out during the winter, you keep them somewhere else warmer during the winter, and then you move them back to, after the spring and the grass grows back. So you're gone for you know eight or nine months at a time. Uh, one rule of thumb I usually use is that cyclic movement is six months or less, periodic movement is six months or more. And then lastly, you have migration, which is the third type of movement. And this is a permanent move, so you're never going back home, you're creating a new home. Um, and again, this is a picture of little Haiti in Miami, a huge Cuban population that have, have migrated to the state of Florida. You also have different types of migration. There's external migration or international migration. This is across country borders. So you'll notice on here it's the example of people in Central and South America moving into the United States. That would be international, crossing over country borders. You also have internal migration or intranational. Those mean the same things. And that is where you're moving within the same country. So you'll notice on this map of the United States, a large number of in migration is going to be into the Sun Belt or the southern states where you have um, perhaps it's because there's more businesses moving to the south for more room or cheaper taxes. It's a more temperate climate. Uh, there's lots of reasons why, but this, this does seem to have quite a bit more in migration than other regions of the country. So why do people migrate? These are our push and pull factors. Um, we can also have two larger classifications where we talk about forced migration and voluntary migration sort of self-explanatory, but forced migration is where where a, where a outside group forces humans to move somewhere else. They have no choice in the matter. Voluntary migration is where the humans choose to move. Um, it is debatable about the Irish potato famine, whether it's forced or voluntary. It was it, it caused a huge migration to the United States in the 1800s. And they would, have di they would have died if they stayed in Ireland, so in that case it feels like forced migration, but they chose to go thousands of miles over across the, the Atlantic Ocean. So that, in that sense it feels voluntary because they got to choose where they went. So the largest ex example of forced migration is the Atlantic slave trade. As Europeans explored and then colonized the New World, they needed workers to work the land. They didn't want to do it themselves. So they used the continent of Africa for the majority of the workforce. Uh, and those slaves were brought over on boats to all over Central, South, and North America to work on those plantations. They were not given any say-so in the matter. It was 
uh, horrible migration itself. Um, so again, it's forced migration, it's global migration flow, and it is um, international migration. Voluntary migration often is connected with the idea of distance decay, and this will relate to Ravenstein's laws of migration in the next slide. But the idea is that the further the distance, the less likely people are to move. There's less connections, less interaction that goes on, and so people would feel less comfortable moving a large distance, which is why you, you talk about the first law or, the, or one of the laws of migration, which is that ma the majority of migrants move a short distance. Um, you also have the law of, with every migration flow, there's a return or counter migration. Several examples of this would be like the uh, Great Migration with African Americans moving out of the South to the North during World War I and then moving back to the South after the Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s. You may also hear about just people leaving, buying a house in another state. They leave the state, somebody else buys their house from some other state. That's again a, a return migration or a counter migration. So those are the first two laws. You also have the third law, which is that if a person moves a long distance, they choose a big city. Again, big cities offer more opportunities and um, accessibility to interactions that help make the move more, more smooth. Fourth rule, uh, urban residents are less migratory than inhabitants of rural. Again, because urban cities have more opportunities, if you lose your job in your city, then you don't have to move to another city, you can find another job in that city. Whereas if you lose your job in a rural town, you're probably going to have to move in order to find another job. And the last rule is that families are less likely to make international moves than young adults. It's just easier for single people or, or young couples to move rather than big families. A lot more people to take into consideration. You do need to know these laws pretty well. You do not have to memorize them word for word, and you do not need to have them in this particular order. Um, it's just important you understand what the laws are about. Um, other types of voluntary migration are step migration and chain migration. So step migration is where you move in stages, like you move from your little tiny town in Brazil to the capital of Brazil, Brasilia, before you move to the big international city of New York City. So you're making smaller moves to make it a little easier to make that big long distance move. Oftentimes in the process, migrants find an opportunity somewhere that isn't their final destination, but they stay there as a result. That's an intervening opportunity. You may also have an intervening obstacle that limits your travel to the final destination, and so you stay somewhere on the way. Chain migration is related to kinship links. So when family and friends move somewhere, they write back, they call, they talk about how great it is, and it creates a migration of other family members to that place, which is often why you have uh, um, ethnic neighborhoods that originate someplace, because it's be people don't just haphazardly arrive in the same place as people of their same culture group. They hear about it and they want to live near people that they associate with, so that creates ethnic neighborhoods. So we have three, um, I'm sorry, not three, six catalysts of migration, which are push and pull factors. So these are economic conditions, things that have to do with money. So if you lose your job, it pushes you out. If you get a job, it pulls you in. Political circumstances, th things that your government is controlling. So if you, if you like the government, it pulls you to that place. If you do not like the government, perhaps there's a law you don't appreciate, you leave. That's a push factor. Armed, armed conflict and war. Are, is another, typically it's a push factor causing people to leave, but you could also go in search of fighting for the cause in that war and that would be a pull factor. Environmental conditions are often um, push factors when you have a environmental crisis like a natural disaster that, that destroys your home or your job, but you may move someplace where it doesn't have that threatening natural disaster or it's a more temperate climate, that's a pull factor. Culture and traditions is going to be your, your religion, your language, your ethnic group, things that are going to bring you places to share that. If you feel threatened by your, by your religion, perhaps you're persecuted by it, that's a push factor. And then technological advances. This is going to be things like infrastructure, cell phone, or internet access, clean water, those kind of things. So if you don't have those, you are pushed out. If you, if you go someplace where they do have them, that's a pull factor.
So it's important we understand these catalysts and it's important we con connect them with specific historic examples. So they talk a lot about remittances and the Bracero program, which was a program between the United States and Mexico where Mexicans could go as as workers, guest workers in the United States, and they would bring they would send home money called remittances to to their family in Mexico. This is economic pull factor to the United States because it's more jobs, um, and it may you also could argue that it's a push factor out of Mexico because there aren't as many well paying jobs there. Environmental conditions, they talk about Montserrat with the volcano that erupted in 1995, causing people to migrate out as a result, and then they never really left. They never really, I'm sorry, never really went back. So that would be another um, push factor out and a pull factor to stay in the United States or in the North. In terms of where people migrate, this relates to the migration flows. So we have global, regional, and national. Global migration flow are crossing large bodies of water. So examples of this would be exploration, colonization, Atlantic slave trade. Um, and you should re recall those specific examples that we talked about um, and be able to find those on maps and things like that for global migration flow. This is a great map to refer to. So it doesn't just deal with global migration flow. I would just be careful of that. But anything that's got large expanses across the ocean, so one, two, three, um, even five is large expanses, those are all going to be global. Whereas Russia with number eight, that's going to be more national. You've got um, uh, westward migration here with seven. All of those are going to be more national migration flow, which we'll talk about in just a second. And then you also have sort of smaller areas, regions of the world where it's still international migration, but they're not going across large bodies of water. And that would be regional migration, which we'll talk about in just a second. So regional is where you're going to neighboring countries, but you're staying within the same area of the world. Again, remember our, our rules of migration that you want to associate with people, this idea of distance decay. So if you can share common culture, language, religion, foods, it's easier to make that move. So most migrations are either national or regional rather than global. Um, oftentimes regional migration flow occurs for economic opportunities, like islands of development, which we'll talk about in just a second, or perhaps to reconnect with cultural groups, again the culture and traditions uh, catalyst for migration, or to flee political conflict and war, like refugees or also just um, people seeking asylum. So economic opportunities in regional migration are often um, islands of development, and this is a, an area in a country where either the government or a company establishes strong infrastructure, they build roads, schools, housing, ports, airports, and they it makes it feel like a very developed area of the country, but if you stepped outside of that city, you, would see, you wouldn't see that level of development. So people come to these islands of development for jobs. And so um, this is an example in Africa where there's lots of companies or, or even governments that set up really uh, detailed or, or strong infrastructure in small areas of the country to encourage people to go to it. You may also have jobs as a, as a result of economic opportunities in other countries. For example, in China, there was a lot of movement to Southeast Asia um, in order to find uh, jobs in trade or commerce, um, and so that has created regional migration flow as well. And then the other example with regional is the, the reconnecting of culture groups. For example, Jews after World War II trying to migrate to the, the created country of Israel. It also created Palestinians fleeing or leaving um, the Israel part to, to seek help from other countries like Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon. Um, this is a picture of the West Bank. So uh, real quickly, the, the importance of this is the idea of Palestine was created, um, or it was a country prior to Israel, but when the when British stepped out and the UN stepped in, they split the land into two countries and Israel was formed. The Palestinians didn't agree with this, and so they declared war on Israel, and unfortunately for the Palestinians, they lost all of their land. So there really isn't a Palestine anymore. There's Palestinian territory, but Israel still has control over it. Still a conflict in the world.
I'm going to stop and, and finish up the rest of this video in the next in the next section. Thanks.